Charlie Brooker, you're watching Screen Wipe, slightly different edition this week. We've assembled some of Britain's top TV writers and I've asked them a load of questions about the nuts and bolts of writing. Hope you enjoy it. Well, if you could start off by telling us who you are and what you do. Hello, I'm Russell T. Davis, I'm a writer. I'm Paul Abbott and the most recent thing I've done is Shameless and State of Play. Well, I'll start off yeah. by asking you both to say who you are and what you do. OK. <laughs> who are you and what do you do? I'm Jesse Armstrong and I write on uh, Peep Show. I'm Sam Bain, I write on Peep Show. <laughs> what a coincidence. <laughs> uh, I'm Graeme Linehan and uh, I'm the writer of uh, The IT Crowd and Father Ted and uh, Black, first series of Black Books and De the Big, uh, Big Train. Um, and uh, some sketches and stuff like that, assorted thingies on different programmes. And you think that qualifies you as a writer? <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't ask to come here. I'm Tony Jordan, and uh, I was a market trader for like 20 years, and I wrote a spec script about a market trader. Did you just send this in to the BBC unbidden? We put it in a brown envelope, and I wrote BBC London on it <laughs> and posted it. <laughs> BBC read it, uh, liked it, liked it so much they never made it, um, but gave me a gig on EastEnders. And you were 34 yeah. when you started doing that. And what was funny about EastEnders was that they, they thought that I was, no, they knew that I was a market trader. And when I went into the interview, I was born in Merseyside. But I actually turned into Dick Van Dyke when I went in to see him. So <laughs> I went in and it was like, cool, blimey, hello, mate. Yeah, just got off uh, Daddy Apples and Pears. So they convinced themselves that I was a genuine East End Barrow boy. I'd never been in the East End in my life. <laughs> so you were an imposter. I was an imposter. And East Enders is great. They say, you get these weird phone calls. It's nothing like the East End in my day. It was like nothing. It's too miserable. It's all that. And I heard this uh, production secretary saying, well, actually, I think you'll find that the episode was written by a real East End Barrow boy. Um, and I thought, oh no. So I had to keep up the pretense. And they found out five years later. How did you, how did you get into writing? And I guess it's best to ask how the pair of you got into writing together. Yeah. Well, we met on a creative writing course at university and shared a flat and then started writing together after we left. I ended up working in politics and I was awful at it, a terrible MPs researcher. And you were working in a video shop and we were both yeah. looking for things we'd be better at than what we were doing. I'm not saying you weren't good in the video show. I was great. And how then did you graduate to doing, to actually writing for the TV? Our first proper job was doing links and jokes for the Jack Doherty show, right? Yeah, Channel or five. The Big Breakfast. The Big Breakfast. There's a lot of comedy writers come up through doing like uh, sketches on Radio 4 and a sort of comedy route. Um, uh, and then end up writing sitcoms later. We, the first thing we ever wrote was like a narrative. We always wanted to write narrative, and then we ended up trying to make a bit of money by doing those kind of yeah. writing in a room, which we were never terribly good at, kind of like little zingers and that kind of slightly tabloid kind of, our oh, fucking top you, mate, I've got a better zinger than that. And we'd be in the corner going, oh, I haven't really got a zinger. Um, <laughs> we watched a couple of really bad sitcoms as are usually on British TV, traditionally, somewhere in the schedules, and thought, oh, that looks like you must be able to do one better than that. Well, it was ironic, because I think the show that we were watching and thought that's terrible was The Upper Hand, which was an American uh, show that was readapted for the UK. And the first proper job we got was readapting an American show for the UK, and it was much worse than the upper hand <laughs> when it was on telly. So we were wrong in amazing. thinking that we were going to make it uh, uh, better. Hi, hey, Doctor. Thank you so much for saving me from the Daleks again. I'm such a helpless idiot. Stop talking, Sarah Jane, and keep jiggling up and down that jumpsuit. Oh, Doctor, I need to give me your sonic screwdriver, quick. Body gate, body gate. All I wanted to be from the age of five was a surgeon who'd work in Africa on uh, cataracts, uh, but not for God. And that's all I thought I was going to be. I started writing and never stopped. And it, everything happened really quickly. It was a weird, weird thing. It found me and I, I loved it. I think it was part of my personal, I needed it as a vent valve. You, how did you break into it? I mean, uh, Well, I wrote 
uh, short stories that you know you sell to like tidbits or weekly news kind of thing, and you get twenty quid, ten quid, and and I did a couple of those. Then I wrote for Jackie magazine, writing the balloons for you know photo love stories. Uh, I used to write about three of those a week, and you got like seventy quid a story. Paid for my first flat, and I realised mm. once I realised that you pay for a flat with my hobby. It wasn't a hobby; it was a career. Within I think a year of that, I was on Coronation Street with a cheque that used to say writer. And I thought, oh, wow. And so at some point in, in the game, I had, yeah, I devoted enough energy and time to, uh, uh, to know that by the time I got that check, it was an achievement. We, we noticed one night when watching Smith and Jones um, that there was a long list of writers at the end of the show. So we thought, oh, they probably take submissions. So we wrote to the producer, which I think is a good tip, and, um, and just said, we write sketches, would you like to see a few? I don't think producers get a lot of, of, uh, of letter, letters like that, so... Um, they will now. <laughs> they will now, yeah, I've ruined it for everyone. <laughs> we handed in about six sketches, a couple of examples of short ones, long ones, dialogue, heavy, uh, quickies, uh, visual gags, just, you know, just to show that we could, we could, you know, do various different things. The thing about Smith & Jones is it was a brilliant show for us to work on because we did learn to do all those things, um, dialogue heavy sketches and, uh, you know, visual gags. I remember once early on, they, they showed us some footage they had, they bought, I guess, of, of tanks. Just loads of tanks reversing, rolling, you know, passing each other. And they said, can you write a sketch about the two people driving that tank and um, use some of that footage? And things like that were great because you, you no longer were sitting around in a room waiting for inspiration to strike. Now you had a, a job to do. And, um, and sure enough, you know, we wrote it and it became one of the best known sketches in, in, in TV history. Can you <laughs> that, was, that was a joke. <laughs> Have you ever heard of a sketch with them with tanks? In it? I was thinking, fuck you. Know, I didn't... <laughs> No, but remember. you know what I mean? But that was really good training and, and, and it, it kind of gets um, the muscles working. I went into television production, but specifically to meet writers and, and, and to get to know them and to just to believe you could do that as a job. At that time, the day job was... You were... uh, working in tech, like producing, producing children's dramas and, and story learning on soap operas at Granada and stuff like that, which is a brilliant job, you know, and I loved all that. So I was like really 30 by the end before I actually sort of said, right, I'm leaving the day job and I'm going to sit at home all day and write and see if I can make a living out of it. Well, what can you remember about the first time you saw something you'd written on screen? That, that was extraordinary and of course it's never as good as you think it's going to be and that's how you learn to write to 120% because you'll get about 80. And um, I, I, it was weird, I didn't like it, I didn't like me and that made me adjust it. And I still don't like stuff when I go, I might like what we've done and how we've made it but I don't think you're meant to love what you've written, because you will never kind of make anything else better. And, but I loved learning that, knowing that you're, meant, you're allowed to get things wrong so long as you attend to fixing them. I remember we wrote some sketches for Smack the Pony and they were on, yeah. and they were, it was, that was a good show, yeah, I think. Yeah. And so they were properly shot and they were nicely performed and they actually the, the uh, performance and that changed them and made them better. So that was the first thing I think I remember seeing and thinking, oh, I could tell everyone that I did that and that would be good. The, the big thing I remember from early on in you, you, of writing is that thing of assuming that everyone else knows better, you know, there's all these people around as there are in this room, camera folk and all the different departments and it's very impressive and you assume that somehow somebody knows what the hell's going on and it's not you and then later on you start thinking that maybe you have got some useful input to make. Well, what can you remember about the, the first time you actually saw words you'd written being spoken on screen? Yeah. Big time. It was. It was that, and I was on a little children's magazine program called Why Don't You, which which didn't even have. Pro it had scripts. It had links. You know, links from one bit to another. And I did everything on that show. I used to make the props. And I used to. I used to. I used to work with the kids and stuff like that. And I knew. I uh, just when you saw something I'd written being said, that's where my mind just went into, and I just went, "That's it." And then when I got my first credit, that writer's credit just meant the world to me. It's just your own brain tells you in the end. It says that's what you love. That's what I'm more proud of that than anything else. So. 
that's the direction I went in. What did you learn from the first time you were seeing the things that you were writing? Oh, you sort of, you sort of always learn like what not to do. You know, you, you, I'm not sitting here going, you're not just going, wow, isn't that brilliant? You go, ouch, you know, and it's like how badly phrased that is. And oh, I sh you know, you rewrite it as you're watching it transmitted almost. Oh, he should have said that. She should have, you know, I should have done it a different way. They should have started in the middle. So, you know, that rewriting goes on all the time, even with stuff you have already written that's got made. So. That never stops, really. That's still the case now. You just go, ouch, for the entire time. <laughs> what sort of routine do you have, if, if any, when you sit down to write? I generally get in the office about nine, 14 cups of tea, play solitaire, have a little scan around the web. I mean, research, that kind of stuff. Start writing about 11, stop again at half 11, have another game of solitaire, another cup of tea. Now one o'clock, I stop for lunch. Start writing again at two after I've watched Loose Women in the News. Cup of tea, solitaire, might have a game of hearts. Four o'clock, I'm now thinking, shit, <laughs> I haven't done anything and I need to make a start. And then I'll write really quickly from four o'clock to six o'clock. And if I've done what I need to do that day, that's fine. And if I don't, then I'm there. I can be there at midnight. I might spend a day and never write down a word. And then I'll go to bed feeling a bit depressed and a bit worried. And I'll think, I really have to do something, you know? And then the second day I'll come along, I'll wake up still worried. And then I sit down at the computer. Um, and I think, because I'm so worried, I'll ease into it. And I um, start procrastinating again. And then another day passes and I still haven't done anything. Then the third day, or maybe the fourth, or maybe it's into the second week, I don't know. But, but, but at some point, um, I start having ideas, I start, I start panicking so much that I say, I better actually look at something. I look at things I find funny online, or, or, and I see, I see, is there anything I've seen recently that struck me as funny that I can use? I have a website, and I, I post up anything that I find funny. And one of the things I posted up was that, um, that guy who was accidentally interviewed on the BBC. Guy Cuny is the editor of the technology website uh, News Wireless. Hello, good morning to you. Good morning. Were you surprised by this uh, verdict today? I'm very surprised to see this verdict to, to come on me. And I thought, well, that would be a brilliant thing to happen to Moss, you know. <clears throat> so I had him brought on to the news and interviewed about Iraq by yeah. Percy War. Gavin Breyer's here with developments in North Korea. It's five years since the war in Iraq began. The conflict rages on with no hope of a solution in sight. I'm joined by Stephen Premel, a spokesman for the Ministry of Defence. <laughs> Mr. Premel. Hello. Hello. Uh, Iraq is a gigantic and bloody mess, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> so all these things that I'm procrastinating, I'm filling my time with, part of it is fear and not wanting to sit down and write, but the other part of it is feeding the subconscious. Because if you keep, start feeding the subconscious with stuff at that stage, It'll build up and build up and build up. And then finally, when you do have to write, you've hopefully built up a, a kind of store of stuff in your subconscious that you can draw from. It used to be uh, 10 hours a day non-stop. Uh, you know, kind of uh, lunch breaks, tea breaks and stuff like that. But now I try to, it's quite hard. I get about three days in 10 to write. And that's not enough time to finish the jobs I've got to do. So I've now employed people as part of a fire firewall team to make sure I sit down and do the writing. And of course, I'm paying their wages to make, make sure I've got the space and the time. And I loathe them. I absolutely loathe them because, you know, it's like telling me what to do. And I know I've got to pay them to do that. And I keep paying them, so they're doing something right. But um, <laughs> I have to be forced to sit down now. Yeah, we sort of do a one, 10 to 6, or basically that's our day, isn't it? The TV day. We do all the sort of storylining for, for episodes and, together and we sort of do a lot of detailed scene by scene breakdowns of everything we write and then we go away and we write the dialogue separately and email each other chunks. Which is the most difficult bit is it? The, the plotting is by far the hardest bit. It feels like that's the bit where you really need someone else in the room because you get an idea and it's no good and it's difficult to get to the next idea unless you've got someone else to, to bounce off. So I think like, some level it's like engineering or building a table. It's just kind of making sure it all works, and it's can be quite um, exhausting. Starting without a, a story outline can really can really hurt you. It's, it's like eating a dessert and missing the main meal. But then that's just our experience. So there, there are writers who, who who can do it, who sit down yeah. and sort of enjoy. Oh, and I'll, get, I'll find out where I'm going. The bastards we call them, talented bastards. <laughs> I like the 
just free fall of, of just starting with a blank sheet of paper. Because what I do have before I start is generally I have a rough, in my head, a shape of the piece. And, and I'll absolutely know what the, what the opening sequence is going to be. So I'll just start and I'll write that. Um, and I kind of know where I'm going, the kind of area. So I use that as a guide. With a show like Hustle, I have no idea, because the way that Hustle works is that it gets ever more complicated. It's a bit like um, painting yourself in a room, you know, painting the floor and end up in a corner. And I just do that, and I get to page 55, and I've now got 10 pages to explain how they got out of it in flashback. And at that point, I swear to you, I have no idea. I sort of work it out in my head, but not in order. So I haven't got scene one, scene two, scene three, scene four, scene five, and um, on paper at all, I've just got all these notions, some of which are weak and some of which are strong. And then as you're writing, and there's suddenly a weak one can become strong and a strong one can become weak, and you just follow it, it's like surfing it almost. Um, Look at me, what a daredevil. <laughs> what an adventurous man I am. Um, but it is, it's like you just sort of oh, slalom your way through it and see what's working and what doesn't. I come up with a, a plot structure that I know will get me to a, through a first draft. I, I, I come up with a plot structure that, that just says, right, that, that will happen there and that will happen there and this will probably happen at the end. I can write this now. And, you know, I use that to get through the first draft, but, but the, I see the first draft as a... Um, I see the first draft as toilet paper, basically, you know? I mean, the first draft to me is just a bunch of notes. I love things that... A funny image that are... Like, one thing that struck me as funny recently I may well be proved wrong, is uh, it's the idea of, of Roy with no shirt on in the office. For some reason, Roy walking around the upstairs area with no shirt on really made me... I just thought, that's, that's funny. You know, that's a funny image. And, and then I just start, how can I engineer that? How can I make that happen? And what are the ramifications? I usually try and build a plot from, from those kind of moments, those kind of moments that aren't satire, they aren't... Um, uh, they aren't uh, explainable. In, in, you can't say, well, this is that. This is a parody of such and such. It's usually things that, that are like, as I say, born from the subconscious and are, are more interesting because they're kind of dreamlike in a weird way. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. The state of play, I knew it wasn't a political thriller. It's just a story about a, you know, two characters, one of whom happens to be a politician. And I know it was more defined as a political structure by the time I've written it, but I didn't storyline that at all. I started typing and I got 10 pages in and going, oh my God, oh my God, he's dead. Sonia's dead. She's dead. What's going on here? And you go, well, you better work it out because you're getting paid to do it. And I love that. I love turning corners without seeing the bends. So you don't sort of sit there with index cards working out? I, I've had to in the last two weeks. I had to because there was a time imperative on the script. But uh, yeah, I like not knowing where I'm going to end up. Uh, you know, kind of taking a leap, but not knowing where you're going to land is really, it's a really respectable way to write. Do you ever find that you've painted yourself into a corner? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, but I love... Yeah, no, it is. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a multiple split personality in a really healthy occupational way where you're going, oh, you think I can't get out of this one? I think I can't. And I have to talk to myself like that all the time, going, yeah, yeah, bet you can't, bet you can't. And, and it is professional petulance. And, uh and I love proving that I can when the odds are against me. Queer as Folk was like, Queer as Folk was a nightmare because it was just this, you know, right about gayness. So it was like, ah, there's the whole world. That was like too bad. I spent a long time walking around in a proper old panic about that because it was just too wide. It was like, it's like saying to be right about everything. I was like, where do you start? And then I just met these two people. I was like clubbing in Manchester and I met these two people, one of whom was just, two best friends, and one of whom was just completely in love with the other. And the other knowing it but never recognising it. And they'd been best friends for like 10 years and they were both suffocating each other. And I just thought, oh, that's it. Oh my God. Vince, hard on. I <laughs> have <laughs> not. I didn't know you cared. Oh, no one's looking. Go on, get it out, get it out. Oh, oh. six months since I've had a shag. It's like Pavlov's dogs. <laughs> you sad bastard. 
And I really, I thought that's it because I've done that myself so many times, stuff like that, and requited love, being the chimp at the side who just... The who's, more who's pain. Just, oh, the more pain, exactly. <laughs> but, you know, it just, I just thought, oh, there's a story. That's, if you talk, if you write about the gay world, that's a story I could use to pull myself through like a guide rope and, and get my way through it. So it tends to start with just one thing and then you see if that echoes. And that, I mean, that sort of leads us on to characters. So there, you, that's an example of, of you kind of plucking some characters from real life. But if you're, if you're in a, mm. a situation where you're having to invent a, a new companion for the Doctor, or so, yeah. where do you start with that? It's a terrible answer to that, because it's just, it's just instinct. I just sit down and start writing them, and that's what I'm good at. I am good at that. And, and I don't sit there with a pad of demographics and, and things like that, saying, oh, she must be this, she must be that. I just think... I just know her. Just Rose Tyler. I just know her. I just know from the moment they asked me to do Doctor Who, I knew what the companion like would be like. I knew where she's from. And that's a very specific example. It's a very iconic character in a way, but that's it. I'm like that with... I know some people sit down and draw up lists of where, they went to, where these characters went to school and what knickers they wear and what they have for breakfast and do they smoke or not, and I don't do any of that. It's like, it's just... It's why I'm a writer. I can imagine characters and I can imagine their voices and I'm good at writing their voices as they would sound, and it just comes out. I think that has to be something that you have to recognise something of yourself in there. There's got to be that empathy. I kind of bring different aspects together of people that I know or people that I've met, and I kind of mix and match. It's almost like Mr Potato Head. What you add to that, then, is a research. Um, and in the case of Hustle, you come out with the character of Mickey Bricks. I, uh, you know, I had a mate who was effortlessly cool. You know those that I could never do. You know, I always stub my toe when I go to the bar. The door always closes in my face. It doesn't happen to me. I've got this friend. It's ridiculous. He doesn't even walk. He's on wheels. He just glides. Sorry to have kept you good people waiting. Traffic was awful. Sometimes you get lucky, I, I, I think, and um, you accidentally. This is what happened to us on TED. We accidentally created. A, a bunch of characters who really spoke to each other. And that's why the show hit the ground running. What we didn't realise was that we... It, it, you know, these were all separate people, but when we brought them all together, it looked like a family. That's the, the key to it, and that's why I think it was such a big success right off the bat. Hey! They on! Oh, they are, Ted. Yeah. Oh, wait now. What? They've gone off again. <laughs> Yeah, wait, wait, yeah, that's it, Ted, they're back. No, God, they're gone again. Right, wait a minute, Ted, no, keep it like that. No, God, oh, God, Ted, that's it, Ted. You're a genius. Gone again, right, back, gone, back, gone, back, gone, back. Dougal, just sit down. <laughs> How do you avoid cliches and using stock characters and stock dialogue? And... I kind of like some cliches, because they're funny, you know? Um, I guess there's an argument that, that Moss in, in the IT crowd is the most you know, cliched nerd character ever, but but that kind of suits me. It kind of suits me, the idea of a glasses-wearing nerd. Oh, four! I mean five! I mean fire! <laughs> you can go so cliche, it becomes... Yeah, well, exactly. That's kind of what we did with Ted as well. We had an alcoholic who, who drinks toilet duck. You know what that does to you. How many fingers am I holding up to you? And a character so stupid, he sometimes doesn't know that he's not slept. Anyway, night, Dougal. Night, Ted. <sighs> oh, damn. Oh. <laughs> no, no, Dougal, it's not morning. I just switched on the light again to wind the clock. <laughs> All right. Sorry about that, Ted. <laughs> People might have noticed I'm not the most naturalistic of, of writers. I, I like broad strokes and, and big comic moments and big gags and chunky jokes. Three people in one. I mean, most characters should be a good three people you know. So you don't pick, literally pick. I mean, Frank in Shameless is three to four people, uh, both male and female in my family. They never know which bits are them. I, they'd all pick the wrong bit, you know, just when it's quite kindly at Christmas or something like that, and you'd go, well, that's more like me. No, it's not. You're that twat. <laughs> I'm there to you right, Frank? Hello. You OK? Is that my teacher? Yeah. I, I just... I just meant... What happened? <laughs> Jesus, Frank! Looking at bugs on me, I'll pass it on. When you were coming up with the characters for Peep Show, w were those kind of blank sheets of paper or were those moulded around the actors? Well, yeah, we knew that Dave and Rob would be in it. 
So we, we did design it for them and that is a huge bonus because as soon as you get them in the room, you're kind of, the character's molded to the actor much more tightly than if you're just casting it. I, I got it! I, I got one! I got one! Congratulations. You've killed a sentient being. Richard Moss was created for, um, for Richard Ayoetti, but, but we had to find Chris O'Dowd, we had to find Catherine, but... I knew I always wanted Matt Berry, and I always, I always wanted um, Richard Awadi. You know, with EastEnders, I worked out as I progressed, and you know, in the last two or three years I was there, I was a series consultant, and um, I just worked out that the, the, the characters that really worked were the characters that were quite close to the actors. What we, we started doing was we used to do actors' workshops, so we'd literally trawl and get twenty or thirty, forty. Uh, actors from London um, into a rehearsal room. The Slater family was a good example of that. We just literally got 30 actors over three days in a rehearsal room. The first person that stood out for me was Jessie Wallace. She just came in, it was Cat Slater. Jet black hair, really filthy laugh, um, blinged up, short skirt. It was like, wow, it's fantastic. So we took Jessie and then gradually saw who kind of did that and then Casey Ainsworth and and, and the, the Slater family came together. What are you doing behind there? Don't tell me you've gone and got yourself a job. Don't get too excited. Just open a donut in distress. The casting of EastEnders there, or the creating those characters, that almost sounds like casting a reality show, in a way. Yeah, but, you know, it's not many miles away. I mean, that's what, that's what EastEnders is, you know, that's, that's the con, isn't it? Isn't that what we're saying? Aren't we saying that Albert Square actually exists? I think it's just the way that you approach things. I think it's the way that you do things. And the genesis of Life on Mars was, and Gene Hunt, was that we wanted to write the Sweeney, but the Sweeney didn't exist. So we said, well, can we write the Sweeney? Can we do like a period piece? Can we do that again? Because what was interesting was obviously the pace laws had come in in the meantime. So modern police dramas, can't, you can't beat people up anymore and throw them down the stairs, it's not allowed. And it's worse than that, it's unrealistic. So can we do a period piece? That's really not going to work. OK, well, how do we get there then? And once we started on that process, it kind of just slotted into place. And Gene Hunt was basically Jack? Gene Hunt was Jack Regan. Police, stay where you are. You're Nick, Sonny. See, so you've got your vickers in a twist. How important do you think a character's name is? The brilliant thing about working with Arthur was we used to enjoy naming our characters so much. Like, we, we, we just... Endless, had endless fun doing it. Um, you know, Noel Early, you know, um, Noel Furlong. Um, uh, I'm trying to, oh, Pat Mustard, who's the name of the, 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 the milkman in Speed. These names, we just love them. Pat Mustard, immediately the character just pops into life in front of your eyes. On my own, I'm not as good at it. I can't quite do it. I can't quite decide on a name. I can't quite commit. One of the reasons why the IT crowd took, took so long to find, um, to, to kind of find its legs was because uh, I, I couldn't decide on Roy's name. First of all, his first name. It took me forever to come up with Roy. <laughs> and, you it's know, only three letters. I know. And then, uh, well, it's very different to, if I called Roy Jim, that's a different person. And... Um, and so I was thinking, you know, I was almost, almost literally thinking, is he a Jim or a Roy? Or is he a Phil? Or is he a Paul? You know what I mean? And it, and it drove me nuts. It was interesting doing Tortured recently, which we're now, which we're now turned into a thriller with three writers. So we all had to work together on a continuous story. So we all sat in a room. It's the first time I've done that, with a, a thriller sort of thing. And, um, Anyway, to invent new characters that came along. And I was going, right, there's a boy called Stephen, and this happens to him. And the other two writers were going, how, do, how did you just make his name up like that? And it's like, it's, well, that's his name. It's like, and they obviously go through a process of sitting there, you know, no one's right or no one's wrong. They go through a process of sitting there going, oh, is he Arthur? Is he Albert? Is he Stephen? Is he Jake? What fits? And I just hit it. I just, the moment I think of them, there's the name. Otherwise, otherwise they don't exist, really. Um, when you're writing, Dialogue. How can, do you do you hear it in your head? Do you speak it aloud, or what happens to me is I I have a scene heading, so you know it's interior, um, wine bar, day. I I put the characters in there, 
And if I've done the work on the characters and I know who they are as people, I put them in there and I put, take that little thing and I put it in my head and they start talking to each other. And I, I write down what they say. So I absolutely hear it. And it is sometimes I can't type because I only type with one finger. I'm doing that, I don't know why. I only type with one finger. Really? One finger. And uh, I'm quick though. I am the quickest finger in what? the West. I am literally like that. Uh, but I can do... That's crazy. I can do 20,000 words a minute. It's like, it's like Superman. What I do is I think... What I do is I, I act out the characters on the page. I think it's sort of like being an actor in your own head. In a way, it doesn't feel like proper writing yes. somehow. It's, sort, it's different and you... It's, it's like you are sort of playing and messing around and, yeah, it's... it's Channeling. Chat is a bit channeling, yeah. <laughs> that was a wanky term I just used. <laughs> it's a psychic term, isn't it? <laughs> now and again, I, I see it typed up like ticker tape. And you go, oh my God, that's a good line. Like, I've just been given it from somewhere else. I mean, from someone else. And, uh, yeah, and it's, and it's always better than the one I would have thought of first. Uh, what, what do you think differentiates good dialogue from bad dialogue? You know, the easiest way to, to explain it, I guess, is write your sentence, whatever that is, all right? So it's two guys outside a pub, they come out, they're going in opposite directions, and the dialogue is, great having a drink with you, really enjoyed it, great game, game of darts, I go now, I'm going to have a shower, and I'll see you later, all right? And that's, because that's, people do write dialogue like that. And a good test is just keep taking words away, take them away one at a time, so it still makes sense. So that get, gets rid of all the... I am's and the everything else, all the li all the things, and if you do that, what you end up with is later, and that's actually how people talk. I think you can learn craft, um, you can learn story structure, you can learn narrative drive, but if you can't write dialogue, you're kind of screwed. Bad dialogue is, is like ninety percent, ninety five percent of television, and most television dialogue is just really functional and talks about the plot and ping-pongs. It's like you're, you're absolutely in trouble when people are actually, this sounds weird, but where they're actually talking to each other. Where they go, what are you doing here? I'm doing this. Why? Oh, because I did this. Oh, who said so? He did. Why? That's just rubbish. That's just explaining the plot. It's just filling two pages, actually. I saw a drama once that, that I won't name, but it, its opening line of dialogue was, happy wedding day, sis. Like, wedding? Sister? Right, got it. It's like, ouch! And who calls their sister sis? It's like, you know, it doesn't exist. It's, and you shouldn't write like that. You, you, you're giving up all responsibility if you start, if you... You know, it's like you are faced with those scenes where you've got to say that someone's their father or someone's brother to this character. And you must not write dialogue that says, well, you would say that, being my brother. You know, that's, that's so often you hear that on telly, and you're just doing a bad job if you're doing that. And I know why people do it, because they're sitting there going, how can I explain this is the brother? You've just got to write it better. Or you've just got to... There's a great phrase that Jimmy McGovern uses, that he says, I would rather be confused for ten minutes than bored for five seconds. In good dialogue, they're not really listening to each other. It's like that great phrase, which is that the, the opposite of listening is waiting because you're just waiting to say your next thing. And that's everyone in life all the time. People hardly ever listen to each other. It's like when you're writing dialogue, it's actually two monologues that just connect sometimes. A good dialogue just bristles and sounds like two people in a room instead of a page of dialogue going chunk, 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 like that. I don't know, I think. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. I wasn't listening, obviously. I was thinking <laughs> of my next question. <laughs> what, whatever, yeah, what, yeah, that made sense. Where do you want to start? Um. The inside's bigger than the outside? Yes. It's alien? Yeah. Are you alien? Yes. Is that all right? Yeah. It's called the TARDIS, this thing. T-A-R-D-I-S. That's time and relative dimension in space. <laughs> and sometimes there are really functional things like plot exposition, especially something like Doctor Who, where it has to be more functional than anything else. We've got to say, this computer has this function, it does that, but... But then you just get that over with. It's like then you've got the doctor to just come in and say those things. Get it open. <laughs> What's wrong with your sonic screwdriver? Nothing. <laughs> sonic Blaster, 51st century. Weapon factories of Villengard. You've been to the factories? Once. Well, they're gone now, destroyed. Main reactor went critical, vaporized a lot. Like I said, once. There's a banana grove there now. I like bananas. Bananas are good. I remember when I, when yeah. I was trying to write Dead Set, Weirdly, I looked at a script for um, Ultimate Force, which was the Ross Kemp <laughs> SAS 
<laughs> and I was really impressed with the with the stage directions, which were action. How hard is action yeah. to write? It's really hard. So how it? do you how do you how much attention do you pay to oh, stage directions? Tons, absolutely tons. It's as it's as important as the dialogue. It's like it's. Because what you're doing is getting it across to the director, who will then get it across to the audience. So you've got to be so precise with it and not lengthy. There's nothing where you know it's like it's like in a novel. You know when you turn a page of a novel and there's no paragraph break. You go, oh, shut up. Uh, mm. Paragraphs are good, and it's the same on a script. It's like the more things, if it's a great big chunk, oh, you're bored already. It's like I, I literally describe characters with three adjectives. It's like if Stan walks in the room, I say he's 45, fat, angry. And you've got him. You know, is that there? You've got him. Then you can elaborate from that. There's more to say about Stan, but it's like you don't need. You know, the script is there to explain the rest to you. And a bad script goes. He was brought up here. He's the sort of man who never takes fools gladly. Everyone always says that. And it's like all those. It's like, but but way beyond character descriptions. It's like, you know, if it's a chase sequence, the words you use should be exciting. And I use less full stops. I use dashes then. I start a sentence with a dash. If it's a chase, you go, and the doctor's running. You start with an and, you know? And it's, and, and then you go, you do a line break. And so the door blows open. So it feels as fast and as exciting as, you know, big blocks of prose aren't exciting. And stage directions should represent the dynamic you need to get from one place or another. I mean, somebody, if somebody's got to answer the door, you have to write that. So learning how to edit stage directions teaches you how to use dialogue efficiently. Often sort of new writers don't bear in mind how much something's going to cost. And so they'll sort of write in, you know, I don't know, a scene on a spaceship or something willy-nilly. I mean, in, because you've got all this experience, to what extent are you bearing in mind the practicalities of actually shooting the thing while you're writing it. I think you try and write with two heads on in that regard, that you're like, oh, let's totally disregard that, whatever is funniest, but you're always going, look, don't put it on a fucking aircraft carrier because that's just not going to happen, so... Um... And it's also sometimes it's more like pity for the actors. You don't want to dump David Mitchell in a freezing lake in the middle of December because <laughs> everyone's going to be unhappy, especially him. I think actually that sort of stuff you is a bit. It's almost a shame because I think you do. One does become quite aware of that of, of the, the, yeah. the physical endurance aspect, which is quite great for performers. Uh, and it's probably not to the to the no. advantage of the of the comedy. But shove him in the freezing lake. <laughs> exactly. He deserves it. <laughs> When, when you're writing, um, to what extent are you writing for a particular audience oh, or a particular a viewer? One. I know, because, you see, it's my job as a writer to sit here and say, you're just there to be the writer and to tell the story and to serve the story, and every single writer has to give that response. And I'm now in the really weird position of having written something with Doctor Who where I really, really thought about the audience. So I knew it's a big, public, expensive show. So I really, really aimed it at women, aimed it at children, aimed it at men, aimed it at all those demographics, and it's the most successful thing I've done. So that's a nightmare. It fucks every writing theory in my head. <laughs> it's a very focus-grouped show, Doctor Who. It was invented from a focus group in 1963. It was planned by a committee full of people to fill the gap after Grandstand and Jukebox Jury. It was a focus group invented show. In the, honestly, that goes against everything I, know, I, I know, and believe the, about focus groups. I know, and it's the longest running <laughs> drama in the country. It's just weird, it's wrong, isn't it? It just defies all the rules, Doctor Who. And now I find myself in that position of it breaking all my rules, and it's clearly working, and that's wrong. How long does it take you to write an episode? It takes about a month. Aggregated out because you we do you know we do it in these weird bits like we do a, a, a month of doing all our stories and then we you know at the end we're doing lots of rewrites but the whole process takes six months usually for us to write six episodes. I'd written them in four days in my time and normally I'd say about two weeks or three weeks but that's just the typing it's like the thinking has gone on for years. I think the last one was about three years but um, uh, state of play. Episode three, I wrote in three days. Episode four took me seven weeks because it had a bigger job to do. I try and do office hours, which never work. And basically what happens is that I, I learned uh, quite early on that I can write quickly. Um, so I used to write an episode of EastEnders, sometimes overnight. In fact, I went back to do a, a, an episode last year, which was a one-off. I said I'd never go back and do any more, but it sounded like a great way to sign out, which was the first soap monologue which I did with uh, June Brown, Doc Cotton. Um, and I went into the office at, I think, about 6.30 in the evening, bottle of Bacardi, bottle of Coke, ice bucket, 
40 fags, and woke up about four in the morning uh, on, the, on the keypad, I actually had all the letters printed on my cheek, um, with my wife, Tracy, tapping me on the shoulder with a bacon sarnie and a mug of tea. And I looked up and I'd been crying and sobbing, fag ash and snot everywhere, and I'd written fade out. And I thought, oh fuck, I've finished. I think this is something that a lot of viewers probably don't realise is that you might suddenly have to change something for some unforeseen oh, yeah. reason. I mean, how often does that happen and how do you deal with it? All the time. I was, I was, I was rewriting torture this morning before I came here because because they formed behind schedule. One scene had been dropped. I looked at it and realised you could compress that scene into another scene that's been filmed in next week sometime. So um, all the time, you're, you're always on standby to do that sort of thing. Actors disappear or drop dead or or but most of the time though your rewriting is because the script doesn't work to build that, that that's the greatest part of rewriting is just finding it you know even if you've got 60 pages you haven't sort of quite found what you meant and and sometimes you have brilliant stuff in there that it takes someone else to point out and say that character's really interesting he should be at the center of it and sometimes you've written shit and that just needs to be cut out i think the first draft is always a drudge and i wish there were elves you could just you know kind of lay down the canvas and stuff like that well they can't. You have to do it, and you have to bleed. See, the thing about writing is the first draft is so hard that once you've finished it, you, th you don't want to change anything because you think, that was so hard, I don't want to ever do it again. And the truth is, you know, and what, what, what people don't realise is that the, the difficulty of that first draft it's only, it's only for the first draft. The second draft will become easier. And the third draft, easier still. And by the fourth draft, you'll be having such a good time. Because you, by that stage, you'll have stripped away all the dead wood. And you, you'll be adding in all these wonderful new jokes and structural work. And it'll be, everything will su suggest something else. Like the first draft of the work outing, which had all the characters going to a gay musical. The first draft wasn't about what it turned out to be about at all. It was about Moss seeing this guy in, who worked in the toilets, who turned out to be a bully, who bullied him at school. But the whole reason uh, that story existed, suddenly I chucked out, and then it came alive. I'm completely satisfied. It's not unusual for us to go to like 20 or 22 drafts and early on there would be big, big changes and then by the end those draft numbers might be a bit uh, boastful and calling them a whole nother draft when you just change a little bit of dialogue here and there. But we do, we do a, lot, a lot of rewriting is what it's all about for us, really. Yeah, I mean, often an episode is, is as good as the stuff you've chucked out, basically. We, we try and be quite brutal with our material and sort of believe there's always more good stuff around the corner. You have to pretend that you're writing the final script every time and it's a sort of mental game you play with yourself. You can't think, all of this will end up <laughs> being binned that I'm now spending hours writing. You just can't do that. It's very, it's, it's a kind of game you play, yeah. And sometimes it stays, you know, or, you know, and then there will be stuff from the first draft, sometimes a whole scene which just stays. So, you know, you have to keep on believing. <laughs> you have to rewrite and rewrite and rewrite and rewrite. You know, Matthew Graham wrote the first episode of Life on Mars. Um, you know, 30 drafts. It's unbelievable, you know, and I'll do, um, I you know I'll do ten or twelve drafts of a, an episode of Hustle. I'll, you know, it's kind of you just have to keep writing, keep rewriting, keep rewriting, keep rewriting, um, because you're honing it all the time. You're making it sharper, crisper, smarter. How much do you actually enjoy the process of writing itself? Sometimes you sit down and there's a scene and you feel excited to write it, but it's. I feel like it should be more fun than it is. You know, the more fun the writing process is, probably the less good the show will be. And the more hard work the writing process is, the more funny the show will be. God, how depressing. What a disappointment you two are. <laughs> it's depressing. It's yeah, depressing. The secret, we've discovered the secret of comedy, which is lots of work, <laughs> endless work. I've read your, your book, which is chronicling like kind of a year in the life of Doctor Who and your, your yeah. work on it. And you spend a lot of time quite being quite miserable. Yeah, it is. Yes, I do. And which isn't, I only realised that when that book was finished, actually. It's, 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 it was interesting for me to see in print. It's like therapy, actually, but it hasn't helped. <laughs> maybe therapy never does, but um, it's, maybe it's a system I'm stuck in, and it's not how everyone should write. It's not how to write, it's just how I write. And I am stuck in that system of it having to be punishing. 
Why is that? Why? Have you smoked too much? Do you drink too much coffee? And, and, you stay, and yeah, you're sort of addicted to that. It's a sort of addiction. It's like homework for me, and I have to be... I'm due in a script now that I should have started weeks ago, and, and it's just... I just... And I keep putting it off and putting it off. If I could leave here and go and start that script, my whole Christmas would be lovely and everything would be marvellous and fine, and I won't. I know I just can't because I don't... It's like, it's like it has to be punishing in some way, and I don't know why that is, because I love it at the same time, but... But, but I love it afterwards, I love it when it's finished, and I love it when it's made, and then I'm really proud, even though you're critical of it, you know, I'm really, really happy with it, but I hate writing at the same time. I absolutely <laughs> hate it. It's I love having written. I hate fucking writing. I hate the process, but I love having done it, and I love a kind of love-hate thing going on there. Up until quite recently, up until about maybe an hour ago when I met you, I used to think the people in telly had a secret. I thought they all knew something, all right? <laughs> all right, thanks. <laughs> I thought they all had this little thing. So I remember when I first went into EastEnders and I was kind of, I was sitting there and they, I, I had no frames of reference because they would talk about Brecht and Shakespeare and, and stuff that I didn't know what they were talking about. Um, and so I thought, well, they all know something. And sooner or later, someone's going to send me on the course that I need. Um, and of course, that never happened. One common thread that seems to connect all the writers we've spoken to so far is that at various points, they felt like they were a fraud or like they were about to be found oh, out. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, have yeah. you ever? Oh, heard? always, and now, exactly. But everyone feels like that. That's no secret. It's like if you work in the bacon counter in Tesco's, you think, oh, they're better than me at cheese. <laughs> you know, it's like, that's, that's just life. What would your advice be for anyone who's hoping to get into writing? The writer writes. That's it. A writer writes. That's what you do. The clues in the title, yeah? Writer, fucking write. I think one thing that really helped us was, you know, doing a lot of kind of not very glamorous work, like Jesse mentioned before, writing lots of kids sitcoms, learning the trade, basically, because being in production and near production is a different experience sitting at home and pretending you're making a show, actually making one, you get to see what it needs to be done, and it really helps. If you get stuck, I think the best thing to do is pretend to put it away, as if you've, you've you're going to put the key, give the key to somebody else for a week, and you, you'll work it out really fast. You have to be, beat yourself up a bit to get your best work out, and that's when you'll feel really proud. If you want to write something, don't sit down in front of a blank screen. Just, just if you want to write something, to have a vague think about what you want to write about, start taking notes, get, it, get somewhere like either a notebook or a thing online or a thing in your computer where you're collecting every thought you have about the show. And don't write it for ages. Uh, writing is kind of like, it's kind of like having a poo, basically. It's really hard if you don't want to go, but, but, but there's a time when you, when you have to go. And, and, and that's what it should be like. There's be a time when you've put so much stuff in your subconscious, that you're just so excited about writing it that you have to sit down and get going. And that, that, that's really the secret. That's why people falter, because they start writing too soon. They don't know where to go. They sit down. They don't know what the characters sound like. They don't know what the world feels like. They don't know what the tone should be. They haven't put enough thought into these things. Best quote I ever heard, uh, William Goldman's Adventures in the Screen Trade. And he said, writing is easy. All you need to do is to stare at a blank sheet of paper until your forehead bleeds. I think the only bit of advice you'd ever, I'd ever say to someone is finish it. It's like, it doesn't exist. It's not a script until it's finished. You're not a writer, actually, let's be blunt. You're not until you've written. And you can be, anyone can be. But if it's all in your head, then no, you're not a writer. And if, it, and if it's only two pages, shut up. Stop wasting your time. Finish it. Because no one is going to thank you for those two pages. No one's going to be impressed by those two pages. No one's going to buy those two pages. No one's going to love those two pages. It's just a waste of time. You're not a writer until you've got a script or a novel or whatever it is you want to do. Then you can start the hard work. But up until then, it's just bullshit. So get on with it. <laughs>